This short tutorial on the role out of continuous evaluation for National Diploma students in the Faculty of Engineering in the built environment during 2013 is aimed at both staff and students. Lecturers are required to familiarize themselves with why the faculty switched to continuous evaluation and to take note of the defined guidelines on how to implement it successfully. This tutorial will also be distributed to all affected National Diploma students. They also need to know why their faculty is introducing an alternative evaluation method, what is expected of the lecturer and perhaps more importantly what is expected from them. It is very important that we look back at the past, carefully evaluate what we value, why we value it and how we can build on it to improve. When I presented this slide at our faculty board, the oldest professor in the room was my friend, Professor Alex Hammond, who just turned 69 years. He witnessed the advent of space travel, the landing on the moon, and was fortunate enough to get his hands dirty on one of the first four-digit calculators, a true marvel at the time. After this, he went on to complete his PhD during the 70s and kept on making immense contributions to the advancement of technology up till this day. Now, pause for a moment and just think about how the world has changed since you were a kid in diapers. What is different now than 15 years ago? I'm not that old, only 44. But one of the major things I remember is how the telephone changed. I grew up on a farm and we got our first telephone in 1975. It was a model without the dial and we shared the line with eight other farmers. Our code was two short rings and one long one. It more or less looked like this 1937 model but without the dial. Today, 36 years later, I carry an iPhone in my pocket. So reflect a bit. What was the purpose of this 1876 primitive looking tube? What is the purpose of the latest Samsung Galaxy S2 or iPhone we have today? Well, both of them allows us to communicate with another person. The difference is that new technology opens many alternative ways to better communicate and stay in touch. Think for example about SMS, MMS, Skype, video, maps, intelligent applications, photo streams, weather, find your friends, and so on. It's still a telephone. You still use it to communicate. But it has evolved to match what is technologically happening in the world today. For a moment, Imagine a life without cell phones, without SMSs, without the internet, without being connected. So, let's now consider the evolution of teaching and learning. Here we have a picture of Lecture Hall 183 at the University of Edinburgh. I suppose more or less built at the turn of the previous century. Now for a moment, imagine the assessment and le lecturing practices that existed in 1876. Besides the few whiteboards and some pieces of new technology, 
Has anything changed? Should, some, should something have changed? The answer is not necessarily. It should be fit for purpose. Like a telephone, it still needs to serve a basic function, namely education. But if what is happening has stagnated, then it is time for making it better. Now, for a moment, just think about assessment in particular. From your own experience, which good practices should we keep? Again, from your own experience, which practices should we improve on? How can we become a better faculty? Like the telephone, the basic purpose needs to stay the same, but we should open up for more alternative possibilities. You can still use your voice to communicate on the telephone, but there are also many alternative ways to communicate. If I have to give my opinion, then the goal in the traditional system is passing the exam, not acquiring skills useful to industry. It is not focused on real-world competencies. If we have a test week of 12 days and we write exa exams for 4 weeks, then we don't have more than 10 weeks of contact per semester. In my opinion, that's by far not enough if we want to introduce um, more project work, more problem-based learning, more group work. I also think it's not fair for the fate of a person that is, whether he gets admission to the exam or not, is determined by only two tests. Another problem with the current system is that we are locked into mainly one mode of assessment, namely the written assessment. It's very difficult to introduce um, project-based presentations, electronic exams, portfolios, and so on. The current system is also not responsive to changing and evolving needs. A simple thing like changing an exam from open book to closed book, or vice versa, can take up to a year. One of our main targets in the faculty, one of our main goals, is to make learning significant. And the system as we have it at the moment is simply not conducive to significant learning. So what does it mean to make learning significant? Significant learning does not mean that we abandon the lecture and start something airy-fairy. I will try to briefly summarize what is meant by significant learning using the cone of learning without going into too much detail. It basically boils down to what we do in class. Instead of focusing on one-way communication and students passively sitting and falling asleep, we get students to participate in the learning process. We therefore stop to focus on the top part of the cone of learning, where in fact very little learning takes place, and move to the bottom part of the cone, where the focus is on the real thing where students participate 
and become part of the learning process. This also means that we adapt our assessment practices to assess if indeed significant learning including these outcomes associated with the bottom part of the cone in fact took place. Learning is about making neurons connect in someone's head and hence shaping their thoughts and attitudes. It is brain surgery without opening the brain. It means that we want to switch on as many possible parts of a person's brain as we can because that is when learning takes place. Fortunately, neuroimaging now makes it possible for us to see uh, when someone's brain is switched on and when not. Significant learning therefore includes switching from passive learning where we observe limited neuronal activity in the brain to active learning where the brain lights up as a Christmas tree. Significant learning is also about correcting one horrible mistake we unintentionally make, namely muddling up the goal, the purpose of studying the course. If the purpose that is instilled in someone's head is that he needs to pass the exam, pass the exam, pass the exam, do you think he or she will care about what they can actually do? We should go from instilling that a purpose is to pass the exam to competencies that are useful in the place of work. These normally relate to things we analyze, design, create and evaluate. It normally links to doing the real thing. But listen carefully, I'm not saying we should abandon exams. I'm saying that we should reframe the purpose of assessments to shift from define, list, draw, explain, in other words, the top part of the cone, to competencies associated with the bottom part of the, the cone, the competencies that industry really, really needs. So how do we do that? There are many ways to achieve this goal, but we settled as a faculty on an encapsulated approach we call the Madrashka model. In essence, in this model, there is an interplay between passive learning outcomes, such as define, list, describe, draw and calculate, represented by these colored spaces between these lines and active learning outcomes such as design, analyze, create, evaluate and solve represented by these solid lines in this model. You can see that each real world outcome encapsulates all prior learning and builds onto it. It's also important that we cannot have active learning outcomes without some knowledge components, without passive learning outcomes. But the emphasis is that we need to master the passive outcomes before we can master the actives. So, how do we get the lecturer to make a student's brain light up like a Christmas tree without the lecturer being sent to a mental institution because of burnout or exhaustion. This is achieved by combining a variety of learning modalities. There is active learning in class, there is group learning which can include project based learning, there is also active learning out of class, online or on their own. 
The faculty call this model the Matryoshka model. The inside of these dolls represent the passive learning outcomes and the outer shells represent the active learning outcomes. These give significance to the learning and should ideally relate to competence required in the real world. To maximally reinforce learning, the outcomes should ideally be, ideally be structured in such a way that the smallest doll is encapsulated by the second smallest doll, which is in turn encapsulated by the third smallest doll until all the dolls fit into the biggest doll. I'm sure you get the idea. The question now is, how do we implement the Matryoshka model in practice? The answer is by using an assessment grid. The assessment grid is one of the most important documents for staff, students and moderators. It specifies the outcomes or competencies that, we, that will be assessed or measured. To compile an assessment grid, a lecturer carefully considers the contents of his subject. All the knowledge outcomes, those dealing with definitions, lists, explanations and routine calculations are sequentially listed in the passive learning outcomes co column. Note that to demonstrate the real world competency that is to design, analyze, create, or evaluate something, you need certain knowledge outcomes. These knowledge outcomes should ideally, ideally be taught using online methods, self-study, etc. The time in class should ideally focus on real-world competencies expected from students, which might include problem and project-based learning, as well as group learning. As you can see, each real world competency encapsulates more and more and more of the knowledge outcomes. Although not always possible, ideally, the last two assessments should span all knowledge outcomes. As a student, you should insist on a detailed assessment grid loaded on my tutor. This assessment grid becomes the Bible for the subject. To complete the analogy, know that assessment 1 corresponds to the smallest Matryoshka doll and that the final assessments or assessment correspond to the largest doll. So now let's look at the technical exam example most of you, even if you are from different disciplines, can relate to. If we want to teach someone to play chess, how should we go about it? We need to separate the passive outcomes from the active outcomes. Which outcomes will be passive and which outcomes will be active? Passive outcomes will, for example, be the board layout, the objective of the game, and the rules. In other words, how individual pieces are allowed to move. The real world competencies will be how to open a, a chess game how to play an end game and how to play a real game of chess. Note that you will not be able to open, play an end game or play a real game of chess if you have not achieved the knowledge outcomes, if you do not know how the pieces are allowed to move and the rules of the game. In our faculty, we will standardize on a minimum of six assessments. Assessment six 
which we will come to in a moment, will have many sub-assessments and will carry a weight of 10%. The veto right principle is also applied to this assessment. Assessments 1 to 5 will each carry a weight of 18%. 5 times 18 equals 19. 90 plus 10 is 100. Duration of each of the assessments 1 to 5 will be an hour unless otherwise stated on the My Tutor page of your subject or in your study guide. Note that on the faculty timetable, each Monday from 8 to 9.30 and each Thursday from 8 to 9.30 are blocked for continuous assessments. Only some higher level subjects, S3 and S4 subjects for example, with small groups for which there is no space on Mondays and Thursdays, might have, uh, might have alternative times to write their tests. These six assessments, carried out during the course of the semester, are all there will be to provide you with a final mark. There are no other exams. Note that the nature of the assessments may vary to fit their purpose. There will still be written tests, but some might take the form of project work. Some might take the form of work you have to, to defend orally. Some might take the, the form of e-assessments, real-world designs in the laboratory, software written in front of a PC. The possibilities are endless. There is no restriction on the type of assessment as long as it can be properly quality assured. The assessment type should match the resources available and will require careful planning on the part of the department and lecturers. As previously mentioned, assessment 6 comprise a number of sub-assessments. These assessments may include practicals, group assignments, projects and so on. The last of these is the compulsory lecturer evaluation. The veto right principle means that you have to submit all sub-assessments for you to get your final mark. You have to submit the sub-assessments that form part of assessment 6 even if it's late and you get a zero mark. Also note that for continuous evaluation there is no sick test or special exam. If you miss one assessment and can submit proof of extenuating circumstances such as a doctor's note, then only four of these assessments will count towards your final mark instead of five. Under very unusual circumstances, the HOD may authorize a special assessment if the class, class's overall performance is poor or other extenuating circumstances are present. Thank you for your time. I also want to assure you that we are aligning with best practice observed at first-rate institutions such as Utrecht and Groningen, which we visited. I also want to assure you that continuous evaluation has been tested in the architecture and pneumatics departments for the past decade with great success. All the best.